All right, here we are. Thank you, CMX, for uh, inviting us Web3 folks to your awesome conference. Um, we're not welcome in many places, so thank you for welcoming <laughs> us. <laughs> We exist. <laughs> exactly. No, um, my name's Kayla Haley. I'm so excited to have Charles and Justin joining uh, me on this panel. And we're excited to just talk, um, chop it up a little bit about what, what's going on in the world of Web3. As Savannah just asked, what does that even mean? Um, but first of all, happy merge. Happy merge. Happy merge. Happy merge. merge. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, um, last night slash early this morning, um, the Ethereum blockchain trans transitioned from proof of, uh, proof of work to a proof of stake uh, blockchain. So we are not going to get into all those details today. But um, uh, you know, we're excited about it. And um, well, I just want to kick things off here and kind of just ask, good transition. What are you guys seeing in the space of Web3 that's kind of of note right now? What's, I mean, there's a lot that's happened. Here we are in 2022, it's now September, halfway through September, um, and a lot has happened this year. I'm just kind of curious, what's your, uh, what's your kind of two minute summary of what's been going on this year? Go ahead. No yeah, question. I mean, I, I think for me, like just a little on my background, I'm kind of an old uh, tech guy, Web1. One. one of my first clients was Yahoo in the mid 90s. So I've seen these cycles before and right now we're in a little bit of a, you know, depressive dip where in the Web3 space, people are trying to do a lot of copycatting of things that have already been successful. There's not a lot of innovation and a lot of that has to do with the infrastructure is just not fast enough. I mean, we saw this with the original internet. Um, you know, you couldn't get games to move fast because we were all using dial-up modem. We saw, you know, when Web2 came around, mobile and especially social, um, a lot of these brands taking four, five, six years to adopt social media, get on Instagram and catch up with a lot of these small challenger brands. Same thing is happening right now. We're seeing, you know, the, the space got really excited. It moved really quickly and the velocity was even faster now than it had been in past tech cycles because we have the ability to share with communities, um, to share on social media our successes and what works, what doesn't work, and then have people try to iterate quickly. What that's led to is a lot of copycatting and a very small amount of innovation. So innovation is really going to have to catch up with what a lot of the, the copycats in the industry are doing. Um, and then again, just we're back, we're back in the situation of blockchain speed, raw computing power. Do we have the processors needed to do full 3D rendering? Um, we're back at needing infrastructure again. So these, these cycles do repeat themselves. And I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I've spent my entire professional career in building communities for video games. Mm. So for me, it's been a really easy transition from going from like building video games for Ubisoft and, and Bioware, or building communities for those, those companies, to building communities for Web3 uh, companies. And so my perspective is really on the Web3 gaming side, like, what are people building in this space? And for me, it's a really, really exciting time for Web3 gaming and Web3 gaming communities because a lot of the challenges with these projects that have jumped into the space and found incredible funding over the past few years, yep. like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I think just in, in uh, August, uh, there was... A qu uh, three quarters of a billion dollars invested in gaming in, in, in Web3 gaming. Yeah. So it's still huge numbers, right? Even in, in what we're calling a bear market or a build market. Mm. Um, so what we're seeing is just incredible innovation and all of these projects that may have been a 10,000 NFT PFP project where you, know, you may have seen the monkeys or the doodles or the cool cats. Uh, all these companies want to become gaming companies. Mm -hmm. And so they're investing a lot of, uh, of, of their, their capital into building up uh, uh, the gaming infrastructure. So for me, it's really exciting being on the gaming side of, of, uh, of Web3 and, and building out these digital communities because it's really exciting. It's, it's a really exciting moment, even though, to, uh, to Charles's point, yeah, there's, a, there's still a lot of work to do, to, yep. to do. We are very far from what I would even call like a, a, a MVP of Web3. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, some of the differences, uh, I might just uh, compare and contrast a little bit. Um, in the Web3 space, you know, a lot of these communities are, uh, you know, convening or gathering the, uh, the, around the idea of, you know, um, whatever they've participated in appreciating, right? And so there's definitely a uh, financial component that can be tied to these things. Um, whereas in a lot of what you might call more traditional kind of Web2 companies, um, it's, it's definitely more around, hey, we're trying to build something together. We're trying to participate. We believe in something together. We want to build it together. Um, and so I think what we're finding in this current, uh, as you put it, build cycle, um, <laughs> to be a bit more positive about it, um, there's definitely those who um, might not have had the, um, you know, the build intentions might not be around as much right now. Um, which is kind of good because it's been helping the communities that are focused on actually building great products, uh, solving problems, um, giving them the space and the room to actually do that. So that, I think that's been a, a really positive thing in the last couple of months. Um, you know, there's been a lot of news in the, in the news cycle recently around different companies, um, larger brands that are uh, trying to dip their toe into the world of Web 3 or even Web 2.5, depending on what you might want to call it. Um, I, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts, both of you, Charles, and then maybe Justin, um, around what you think is working really well, right? Again, we're kind of uh, with a group here that's primarily kind of in the Web 2 space. Um, and so what are things that you're seeing that are working really well, and maybe some examples of brands that are doing that well, um, and maybe some things that you're finding or you've seen that might not be working that great? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, where I kind of start is does your brand need community. And I will say where Web3 has had some big mistakes and some big faltering is around those PFP projects, the 10,000 profile pictures of whatever it may be, do not have a well thought out roadmap in what a community use case would actually be. So, you know, my belief on community and what I've always done with a lot of brands and building communities in the past is, are you taking these people on a journey from good to great some kind of transformation, some kind of quest. Community should always revolve around an ever-changing environment where things are exciting. That's why gaming communities do so well. There's always something to talk about. There's always a new quest. There can be new iterations of the product. That's why uh, sports teams have very deep communities. There's always something changing about that team or about that season. Um, and people get to go on that quest and take that transformation. In Web3, some of the deepest communities I've seen have only been on the developer side. So the developer communities have been incredibly robust because they're changing quickly. They're having to build these new products. They're going on a, basically a quest and a transformation to make these blockchain and these, these application layers better. Where a lot of the PFP and NFT projects fail to understand is, you know, they may have 100,000, 200,000 people in a Discord. They only have 10,000 profile pictures to go around. They sell out. And then my biggest question to them is, what do you do with the other 95% of that community tomorrow? Mm -hmm. you, you literally just disappointed 95% of people in your community. Yep. And what do you do now? And typically it's blank stares. And it's because the roadmap hasn't been thought out of how you're actually taking that community on a journey, how are you going to include those other people? So I think, you know, when it comes to the Web3 space, I think a lot can be learned from people that are native Web3 only, should learn from community managers that have been in this space since pre-internet. I mean, before Web1, into the social age, into what everybody's doing now. I think the Web3 people have actually, even though I'm in the space, when it comes to community, have a lot of catching up to do. And it's just because they don't quite understand the, the reason to have a community in the first place and what that actually means and how to execute it. Yeah, I, I mean, what you see a lot of time, also going back to your point about the Discord and like how you might have 200,000 people in your Discord, but 10,000 of your product. Like when have you ever worked for a company where you have had more Discord users than actual customers. Like this is this is a, a mind blowing thing, and being able to engage with these people, these are highly highly motivated people to engage and build and create with you. And this is, I mean, that's what I get excited about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think also 
going going off off of like what web two companies can sort of do to sort of bridge that gap i mean i think you're you're seeing a really interesting time right like um for example, Starbucks just announced this huge partnership with polygon mm -hmm. and the really interesting thing about that that partnership is that nowhere in their in their rewards program did they say, "Oh, you're gonna, you know, this is an NFT blockchain community. This is a Web three community." They called themselves a, a digital community, um, and it, you know, I, I, I think I think that companies like this are trying to find that utility, right? And and Starbucks is creating that by, you know, owning an N NFT. You can go to your Starbucks. And you can earn some points. You can earn free coffee. You can earn, you know, potentially free access. And that's what is is really interesting about this space. And I, I think you know, we were talking backstage about fashion, and uh, and and you know, I worked on a campaign last year with Burberry uh, to integrate their their products into a video game on the blockchain, and that was a really cool experience. And they they dove in, and Burberry was asking me. What were the uh, metrics uh, on our Discord? And I was like, this is, uh, what dimension am I living in right now? <laughs> um, but the, I mean, I think that as these, these companies start you know, dipping the toe into, into the water of Web3, there's going to be a lot of innovation. There's going to be a lot of creativity that comes out of this space. And there, you know, there's going to be uh, things that we have never thought about that, that people think about and, and, and create and build around these massive behemoths of brands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some other examples of other um, larger brands and established brands, you have Nike uh, that ac uh, acquired Artifact, um, and they've done a lot of interesting things with um, what they call fidgetals, um, you know, digital and physical goods. Um, recently, they released the, um, the sweatshirt with like the AR uh, wings that, you know, once it turns around, you can see the wings on the back of the sweatshirt. And so, you know, I think that it's interesting. I think a lot of the communities that I've been a part of, I'm a, I, I personally um, am in a number of, um, you know, uh, Ethereum tokens or NFTs, or whatever you want to call them, um, different communities. Um, that are around, you know, supporting women-led projects. Um, you have projects like World of Women or um, Women in Weapons, um, and these projects really do want to rally around women who can really enter. If anyone does not know um, the demographics of women inside of Web three, it's like five percent. Yeah. Um, so it, there's a lot of work to be done in of terms work. of bringing in um, more, you know, women um, and uh, color of people, or uh, people of color, people of color of people, there you go, um, the whole rainbow. But, um, but, but, but making this a space for people who can really participate and really contribute in a way that's meaningful um, um, so that they are represented in this space. Um, so I think that that's important. But going back to some of these brands, um, you know, you've got, again, Nike, you have, um, you mentioned Starbucks. Um, some other ones would be, um, who else do we have? Pepsi um, or some of these other brands that have been participating. Um, and they're doing it in interesting ways by engaging people and kind of creating these on-ramps through music or sports um, and, and taking things that people are already interested in um, and trying to help folks to on-ramp um, using, utilizing the technology. Um, I think what's interesting with, um, again, we just experienced the merge, right? And so um, kind of this larger project of making these blockchain technologies more um, sustainable um, and more um, uh, sustainable in a way that larger companies feel good about participating um, in, in these projects. Yeah, and that's, a, that's a, a huge point, right? The, sustain, the sustainability of blockchain has been a huge criticism for a very long time. And that's where layer twos uh, have really kind of taken off where, uh, you know, they're, they're zero, zero gas fees, often carbon neutral, but now Ethereum is 99% more sustainable, more energy efficient than it was uh, two days ago. So that's, uh, or even just yesterday. I mean, it's, it's amazing, amazing feat. And we're really at the sort of cusp of, you know, this being such a critical point for a lot of companies where it was like, oh, you know, maybe I, I won't touch this just yet because it has negative impact on the environment. Right. Um, and, but, you know, now we're working with a lot of partners that are like, you know, 
this is something we want. This is something that we see as energy efficient now and that we can really start building creative ways of engaging with our community, engaging with our customers in new ways, right? Um, and, you know, I, for example, we're, you know, our company Enway, we're working with the Olympics and the Olympics is really environmentally con uh, conscious about everything that they, 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 they put in. And so this is something that's really a, a, a cornerstone for them. And so for, for Ethereum to, you know, come out and say, you know, now completely change their engine mm -hmm. to a more efficient one is, is absolutely in, uh, incredible. 100%. I think on what you said too about some of those brands is what their, what their thought process of going into Web3 is where kind of like you mentioned, oh, we're going to add this utility to our current consumer base and we're going to on-ramp them into this new technology. It, it typically doesn't happen that way. Usually what happens is they just unlock an entirely new buyer base of Web3 natives that already have wallets and can now learn more about their brand in a deeper way. Um, like Dolce & Gabbana dropped their NFTs last year. They had eight pieces. You got an NFT and a physical piece, completely couture piece. Um, not one of those eight buyers had ever purchased anything from that brand before. They were all Web3 natives who happened to have a lot of money in their MetaMask wallet. So, I mean, those eight pieces went for over $4 million and not one of them were a, a previous customer of that brand. So, you know, same thing with Budweiser, um, Anheuser-Busch. They've had a lot of, they have a lot of initiatives in Web3 when it comes to NFTs, metaverse builds. Um, and again, like they're not really bringing their traditional community into this space. They're just unlocking a new user in the space. And I will say, Web3 native users, especially for community managers, what they come to learn really quickly is that um, the impatience of that particular buyer is a lot higher. Um, the, their expectations of how quickly they can get something, how quickly they can get a response is, I mean, fairly unreasonable at times, but it's just something to be aware of that that buyer is, re you know, wanting that level of service. And I always talk a lot about you know, moving technology in generations, and that next generation coming up is Gen Alpha, which is basically anybody born after the year 2010. Um, so by the year 2025, that age segment's gonna be two billion people, and it's gonna be the largest age segment in history. Now, they've, they've never grown up without voice search, AI. They expect hyper-personalization on everything. That's why when you're building profile pictures or avatars, they wanna make it look exactly of whatever representation they want themselves to see, you know, what, what they want themselves to look like on screen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as, as community managers out there, it's how do you provide that level of personalization? Um, it's a whole new thought process of buyer, consumer, and community member that expects a level of service that can be pretty stressful at times. So um, just keep that in mind when you're building those you know, community activities that quick response times and personalization have become pretty much a, a requirement now. It's, it's not a nice to have, it's what people absolutely request. And, and building off of that, I mean, what you see in that younger generation of Gen Z, Gen, Gen A, uh, I'm, I refuse to call them Gen Alpha. I, that's just a personal <laughs> thing. Um, uh, I think that's a terrible name. Um, but you know what you see in these these uh, these younger demographics is they they are growing up with that creator driven economy, yep. right? Yep. It is they're growing up with the Roblox, with uh, meme stocks, with Fortnite. with Fortnite, with cryptocurrency. There are so many different ways for a teenager to earn money on the internet right now. It is <laughs> terrifying. mind blowing. Terrifying. <laughs> it is terrifying. Yeah. You know, you, you see these headlines of teenagers, you know, earning uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars off of their Roblox game because they're they're earning this currency in in, in game. And Roblox doesn't even have tech, uh, blockchain technology. They're they're not a Web three company. It, but they are a gaming company. They they are facilitating that creator economy, and. You know, I think that's really what I love about building in the space, that co-creation with the community. Because in many ways, you know, being able to uh, focus on a much larger portion of that community is so important for me. And 
and it's it, it's really where the, the 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 trends are moving, right? And you know, I think when I was working on like Rainbow Six Siege or or Assassin's Creed, we'd always reach out to the top one percent of our creators or the top zero one percent of our our content creators, and we'd throw millions of dollars at them to play our game for about an hour and stream it and or make a YouTube video, um, and. While that was great, it worked, it, you know, it, it, was, it was awesome for content creators. What I think you're gonna see in the future is a more create and earn uh, or, or engage and earn economy where you, know, you can hop into Discord and every message you send, you're gonna earn like .001 per one token or something like that. But over time, that engagement can, can add up. Uh, you know, a, 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 YouTuber with a thousand, a thousand subscribers can create a YouTube video, and then the, the company that they created it for could potentially you know, have an automatic kickback of, uh, of cryptocurrency or an NFT. And you know, I think going back to your point of some companies that weren't do, building this re, uh, in, a, in a good way, you know, just hopping on the bandwagon of, of pumping out some, uh, some, some NFTs. You know, if I buy a Budweiser, I'm not a part of the Budweiser community. <laughs> like, that, it, it, but if I buy an NFT that rewards me every time I buy a Budweiser or rewards me every time I go to a sporting event and buy a Budweiser there, then I am way more invested in that brand. I will, I, I will absolutely buy as many Budweiser's as I can, uh, and, and uh, maybe that's a bad thing to do. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of experience that these companies need to make where it's, it's not just these one-offs. It needs to be an experience. It needs to be integrated with the community. And in many ways, it needs to be co-created mm -hmm. with that community in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's where, um, you know, uh, governance tokens, um, some organizations utilize things like DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, where the community literally gets to vote um, through their, you know, ownership of their of their token um, of that of that group. Um, and it's like, hey, we want to create a new character. Um, for this game, or there's going to be an unrevealed character, um, and the community gets to kind of have the first look at that um, and participate in the story development um, of, of kind of just the whole ecosystem. And these are some of the things that drive the excitement, and, um, and I think that that's a really good and organic way to leverage blockchain technology um, with um, things that people are already participating with. Um, rather than using the financial incentive to get people to participate. That's, that's not going to sustain um, over a period of time, especially <laughs> right now where, we're, where, where the market is crashed by like 90%. So yeah. um, I think as brands are looking to um, figure out how to participate, it's, okay, well, you already have uh, a really successful um, you know, company, community. How do we just now... Um, create a deeper level. I, I've, I'm a big believer that um, a lot of Web2 companies kind of build wide. Um, and obviously in this group community, it's the idea of how to build deep. And so I think that with Web3, it's an opportunity for us to even build even deeper potentially to where those who are already naturally, you already, most, many of you I'm sure have um, community managers who just naturally say, hey, I just feel passionate about this and I just wanna like, I'm just raising my hand to like help, how can I help the next person? And I think that, um, the cool thing that can come from these blockchain, um, you know, crypto kind of communities, NFT communities, is how to naturally, um, um, in, a, in a sustainable model, uh, allow those folks to participate and to, and to serve the community um, and, and for those incentives, incentives to be aligned at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for something like we did, uh, me and a, a business partner of mine, we started NFT Thought Leaders about 10 months ago. Um, because we kind of saw as an industry, we didn't really have a particular PFP project or NFT we wanted to launch, but as an industry, how do we bring these people together in all these cities across the world? Obviously, like we're, we're built on Bevy. Um, Derek helped us out a lot with, with getting set up. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Within five months, we had 23,000 members. And we have a lot of those people that reach out. Hey, I'm in Tel Aviv. Can we just have an event? Hey, I'm in London. Can we have an event? Yeah. And you... It's, 
yes, there's an online component to it, but these people want to be in the same room with each other as quickly as possible. And you know that after five months of us running that, um, got acquired. So now we've changed names. Now we're a different company, but the community continues to grow. And now it's just a really large cohort of people that they've been, you know, helping each other with getting jobs, helping each other with developing different technologies in the space, um, holding events all over the world. And it's, you know, that community is very, they're augmenting what happens online by having in-person events as soon as possible. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, there's a good friend of mine who has a 10-year-old son who just had his birthday, who he got $200 in Robux for his birthday. So, you know, that's like winning the lottery for a 10-year-old. Gold. And so he's sitting there and he's, you know, playing Roblox with his friends and his dad's like, hey, are, are we going to do anything for your birthday? And he's like, I'm doing it, dad. All my friends are here. <laughs> like, we're playing Roblox. Like, this is where all my friends are. So, like... I was at that party. To, you were probably there, <laughs> yeah. Just <laughs> totally immersed in this game. But then you... All of his friends are there, too. They're all chatting. They're all talking about his birthday. They're all, like, helping him go through these different challenges because it's his birthday. Like, it's just interesting to see the thought process of what means community to some people as opposed to what means community to others. And that can be very different. But the thing is, what I found, no matter if it's in person, online, it's a group of people that are going through a transformation to make each other better and support each other in getting better in whatever that subject is. And that's where I think a lot of brands fail. It's why you don't see the Xerox copy machine community, because how are, yeah. much better are you going to make each other you know, copy a piece of paper? Like, some companies just don't need a community. However, you know, there's, there's vintage technology communities where people collect vintage computers, vintage yeah. video games. That's a quest. Hey, I found the, you know, whatever, one of the first Macs out there. Like, just be very self-aware if you need a community or not. And if you do, do it the right way and, and make sure you're making everybody better is, I mean, really what I would say. Yeah, yeah. What would you say um, to all of our Web3 friends? What, what, what do you think um, can be some of the takeaways? Obviously, we're, we're in this room of, of, of um, community professionals and um, folks who've just really dedicated their careers to uh, creating um, uh, spaces for people to grow and develop. Um, what are some things that you think Web3 Web can learn from Web2? The list might be long, so, you know. Well, the, just, just the quick one you already hit on it is building a community around strictly financial incentive based on mm -hmm. degen behavior is going to last about three seconds. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. That's my main takeaway from what Web3 people can learn from traditional communities is don't build a community around money making as fast as you can. Well, it's there you go. not going to be a community that exists very long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, this, this CMX Summit has been amazing. I've been hearing some incredible, incredible community leaders talk about their, 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 their structures and their plans and their philosophy and strategies and tactics. Everyone in this room at this event can run circles around a lot of the Web3 communities out there. Um, and, and that's not to uh, slight the Web3 communities, it's because a lot of times they're just people that are passionate, throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks. And that's the beautiful part of, of building communities in, in this space, is, is that passion, that creativity, but it needs that structure. It needs that, that sort of based in reality perspective of, like, okay, is this going to meet business objectives? Is this going to meet, you know, our goals, our, our OKRs, our KPIs? Because, I mean, a lot of people ask me, what's the difference of Web 2 and Web 3 uh, communities? And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's exactly the same, but entirely different. Um, and what, what I mean by that is that all of the same strategies and philosophies and tactics that you apply to any of your communities can be applied to Web3 communities. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, um, that, I think, takes us to time. Thank you so much, Charles and Justin, so much for coming. And um, I hope that uh, for those of you who are in the Web3 space, obviously get a chance to connect with um, some of the amazing um, folks here and really learn from each other and just kind of um, share knowledge. So, so grateful. Thanks so much, CMX, for having us. And um, that's it for our time. Thank you. Thank you.